We're going to hear um, first from Mr. Steve Mason, uh, who is a patient and also um, has the distinction of being the Poet Laureate of the Vietnam Veterans of America. Welcome to the committee. Well, thank you, Mr. Jones, and all of you on the uh, assembly for this opportunity to speak the truth to power. And make no mistake, I appreciate, as each in this room does, that I am speaking truth to power right now. This is a very serious issue, of course. I accept that uh, life is uh, on one side bordered by oblivion and on the other by infinity. And what the is going on in the middle? And it happens too quickly for me. I'm scheduled to be 65 the end of this month, but nine months ago I learned that uh, I had three weeks possibly, uh, and it was deemed maybe not more than six months as a result of my exposure to herbicides uh, while in combat duty in Vietnam many, many years ago. The day that I learned that I was terminally ill, that there was nothing that medicine could do to ameliorate even my symptoms, uh, I decided that uh, I wanted to live as long as I could, as best I was able, and I wanted to die with the dignity with which I had lived. So life remains for me as full as it has ever been. And I just wish that those whose religions uh, and those possessed of misinformation and disinformation about this particular death with dignity law that exists in Oregon and could be rewritten anyplace else cannot take advantage of such a law as this. This is uh, the word autonomous came up earlier today. Uh, I am a single entity, yes, but I am one with it all. And it would be very difficult for me to sit here before this audience and, and, and speak truthfully that I am not concerned about the hundreds of thousands of others who throughout this country are suffering needlessly, hopelessly, helplessly. Uh, the previous gentleman who just spoke, spoke to the cost. Well, the true cost of any war, whether it be for life or death, or of the, the medical side of this, or the legislative side of this, there's always going to be cost in, in whatever terms but that the family members have to suffer along with the individuals and be traumatized by this is something I could not live with. I have two young daughters. Uh, one is with me today and has spoken to the press on two occasions today already. Uh, she is very supportive and very proud that I'm going to do this. I do not want her to see me wither to some 80 pounds, have some night nurse, shave my beard because it's easier for her to get some tubing in my mouth and, uh, and suffer this exquisite pain that is um, at this point ancillary to my illness, which will, uh, although defined as lung cancer, uh, is in fact uh, waiting to metastasize uh, someplace else. Uh, do I feel confident to make this decision? Well, you folks wouldn't want to make a living playing chess with me. Uh, that's, uh, and I can't throw the frisbee like I used to, and I'm, I don't skydive like I did nine months ago, and I'm not the martial artist that I practiced to be for 35 years. Uh, there's a lot of things that I can't do. But when I am unable to care for myself, when I am unable to think like I think and feel like I feel, I will no longer be me anyway. And rather than wait to be buried, I will have the opportunity to pick that time and that place. And that has given me a free doom that is beyond, you can't assign a value to this. I am so liberated by knowing that when my time is up, I get to choose. I am empowered. And this is what I would wish for everyone who is able to take advantage of this, regardless of their cosmology. And I would, uh, I would probably close by saying that uh, this is not anything but a civil rights issue. This in no way should be about theocracy. You know, we're fighting about this stuff in Iraq. This is about democracy. 
And uh, there was a uh, fellow, uh, a soothsayer, in, uh, translated from the Sanskrit, who said it best for me personally. He said I was a vegetable, a mineral, excuse me, and I died and I became a vegetable. And I died. I became an animal and I died. I became a man and I will die. What? I should fear death? Each time I die, I become something more. I'm looking forward to picking that time. I thank you. I would like to ask one, uh, one more question, and let me turn to where I wrote my notes here. Um, after hearing the, uh, the testimonies from uh, Mr. Mason and Mr. Smith, um, very, you know, very moving and, and compassionate uh, testimony, and I, I thank you for both for coming here because I think it's very important to, to hear that. My question is uh, to Dr. Stevens. Is it, is it Stevens? Uh, how can you look at both of those gentlemen and say, I'm sorry, but you shouldn't have that choice available? My, my moral judgment supersedes yours, and you shouldn't have that available to you. Well, I'm, I went into medicine to, to help people. Um, I did not go into medicine to uh, basically kill them. I did not, uh, and I think what you and what your parents need are ver good caring doctors and good caring nurses to really take care of you and to take care of the symptoms, take care of the symptoms that you have. May I speak? That, that's, what, that, that's, what, that's what you deserve. Certainly, please feel free. I have, um, I have two brilliant oncologists, uh, five other doctors uh, whose expertise is well known in, in Oregon, perhaps elsewhere. Uh, there is nothing they can do medically to help me. Do you have someone in mind? I would really appreciate it. Because I love life. And uh, the first rule of life is that life sustain itself and live. And I want to live. But when I'm no longer able to be me, I'm already gone. But please, if you'll write that telephone number down to that doctor who has a cure for the incurable, I'd appreciate it, doctor. 